When we think about these demographic changes that have occurred in our recent evolutionary past, there's a number of lines of evidence that inform us about this change. Obviously, we have a skeletal record which suggests that people were living more successfully, living longer, and dying less frequently. But we can also see evidence of this population expansion and demographic change in the genetic record. So we can look at actually the pattern of genetic variation to inform us about the population expansion that's occurred over the last 15 to 20,000 years. To get a sense of how we might do this, think about the overall pattern of genetic variation that we have. There's variation that's shared very broadly that we can think of as common variation. And in genetic parlance, when we say ver genetic variation is common, we usually mean it's referred to at greater than 5% frequency in population, which means it's fairly easy to identify by sampling a population, something that's of 5% frequency. However, when we look at a population expansion, when we look at suddenly populations growing considerably in size, we begin to see a slightly different pattern of genetic variation. In particular, what we begin to see is a high frequency of rare genetic variation. Variation that's specific to small groups of individuals or families or small number of pedigrees. In other words, variation that's shared by less than 1% of the overall population. So we can look at this by again looking at this overall pattern of uh, how common variation is. So the fraction of a population that might share that kind of variation and the frequency of those patterns. And when we see a population expansion, what we see is a high frequency of low common variation or rare variation. Variation that's say less than 5% frequency. And this high frequency of that kind of variation is indicative from a genetic perspective of population expansion. It means populations are expanding very rapidly, which means they don't necessarily have time to share all that new variation that's developed. Recall every new individual brings with them, say, a hundred or so new genetic variants. If suddenly you're adding a lot more new individuals to the population, you're going to create a lot more genetic variation that's shared very narrowly within the population by single individuals or by small pedigrees of individuals. So this is the kind of variation we see when we look at very rare variation. Now, one of the important things to point out is this kind of rare variation, variation that's say less than 1% in terms of its frequency within populations, has only been visible to us as we've been able to develop increased and improved genetic sequencing technologies. As we've improved the amount of genetic material we can look at, it's easier to identify that genetic material that's only housed within a small fraction of individuals. So this kind of understanding of human patterns of genetic variation has really only come about in the last 10 or 15 years but it's an important part of that signal of population expansion that we can see. Now there's another important element to genetic population expansion that we can look at as well. Genetic variation is inherited in fragments because it's divided across 23 pairs of chromosomes, and also because each generation there's recombination that shuffles the variation within a chromosome pair. Studies suggest that humans have on average about 33 recombination events per generation. But overall it suggests that when we inherit our chromosome, we inherit it in blocks. Now this is important for how we think about and how we identify natural selection occurring within the genome. Imagine, for example, that there's a gene right here that's being selected for. It's becoming more frequent because it endows some kind of advantage to the people who house it. When that gene is selected for, what we don't mean is that this specific point in the genome is selected for. Because the genome is inherited in blocks, what we really mean is even if this is what's being selected for, we're really inheriting as a block this entire fraction of the genome. So we might suddenly expect to see this fraction of the genome occurring more frequently across populations. Now over time, recombination is going to break this fraction up so that all we're left with is this selected segment here. But this process by which recombination will break up the variation around a selected trait takes a while. So it's a process that takes time. And this is a key that allows us to identify events of recent selection. Because what we can look for in the genome is areas that are less variable than we would expect. So if we imagine this block right here, we expect a certain degree of background variation in the genome. But what we might find is that there's an area that has low amounts of variation relative to the areas around it. This is evidence in part of potential selection. Selection on some element within this block of variation right here and some block of variation that hasn't yet had the time to be broken up by recombination. Because eventually, we would expect this pattern of variation, even if something has been selected in this area, 
to look just like the background variation with the exception of the one area where the gene sits and where selection has been occurred. But what instead we find when we look at the human genome is we find a lot of evidence of these kind of low variation areas. In other words, a lot of evidence of a recent selection. Selection that hasn't yet given recombination the time to break up the pattern of variation. In fact, when we look at the amount of the genome that appears to be under this kind of recent selection over the last, say, 15,000 years, it's equivalent to the rate of selection we'd expect to see spending the last 5 million years. In other words, the intensity of natural selection at the genetic level hasn't dissipated as human culture has developed over the last 15,000 years, it's increased and increased significantly, something we refer to as accelerating evolution. And this might seem counterintuitive, but when you think about it a little more, it makes sense. What's been going on over the last 15,000 years is we've produced a lot more raw material, a lot more genetic variation for natural selection to act upon. At the same time, we've changed the environments we occupy considerably. The movement to agriculture, the movement to sedentism, the movement to more concentrated, dense urban environments, all represent dramatic changes in our environment. Dramatic changes in our environment, of course, change the adaptive landscape. They set up the opportunity for natural selection to act, just while at the same time, the increase in population size has given more raw material for natural selection to act. So while it might seem counterintuitive, it in fact reflects what we know about our evolutionary past. The human population expansion and change of environments over the last 15,000 years have actually accelerated the degree in which evolution is selecting for different elements within our genome. So all of this is to reiterate the point that evolution hasn't stopped. Evolution is ongoing even in human populations today. Evolution simply is the byproduct of variation existing and differential survival and reproduction within those individuals who exist. It's also the product of the fact that we exist in finite population size. And in the case of our recent past, expanding population sizes. So this is interesting for how we view evolution today, for how we view the significance of evolution in human populations today. We're not simply a product of our Pleistocene past or our Pliocene past. We're also a product, an evolutionary product of our recent past. And those evolutionary changes that have occurred in our recent past are a reflection of our very complex cultural and social selves. So genetic data has given us a valuable lens to look at not just our deep evolutionary past, but our recent evolutionary past and how we continue to change today.